you know, we have a responsibility for other people. We have an op- we have a, an obligation to be our brother's keeper, to support our neighbors, to help other people on the world stage. Uh, you know, the United States have defeated Germany and Japan, and both those countries were in ruins. And we were helping rebuild those countries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were helping put together an international order that would, that would be peaceful. And, and so growing up in that as a child, I was born in 1951. And so I, you know, I came of age through the 50s and the early 60s. Um, growing up in that, it just, I never even questioned it. You know, that, that part of the reason why I was on this earth was to serve other people, was to help other people, was to be here for other people. Welcome back to the Max Out Show, where today I'm honored to speak with Tom Hartman, whose list of achievements and contributions would take up almost this show. So we're going to skip most of them, but among many other things, he's been named the number one progressive talk show host in the United States. He's an award-winning and best-selling author of over 20 books and world-leading expert on using ADHD to your advantage. So Tom, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks. All right, perfect. Sure. So let's start your recording. Um, honestly, yeah, super excited for this. Um, there's so much stuff. This hour is probably um, that, that we could fill with all the incredible stories that, that you have to share. But before we dive maybe a little bit about, into your own story, I'd love to talk about ADHD because for almost 30 years now, you've really helped people all over the world understand they're not dysfunctional for having ADHD, but they're simply hunters in a farmer's world. So what do you mean by that exactly? Well, this all started back in the, in the early nineties when uh, one of my kids was diagnosed with ADHD and the, and the uh, uh, psychologist uh, sat him down in front of my wife and I and said, you've got a brain disorder. You know, your brain is lacking a certain chemical and, uh, there's some drugs we can give you that'll replace that chemical and and uh, your defective brain will work like normal. And then gave him a big speech about, and people like you tend not to do well in school, so probably, you know, you should become like a car mechanic or something. You know, there's there are places where you can make a good living that don't require college. And it was just devastating to our, to our, uh, our child. Yeah. And so I went home uh, kind of shocked. Uh, in part because I was horrified that my kid was hearing that his brain was broken, and in part because all of the symptoms that this guy described as being characteristic of ADHD, um, distractibility, impulsivity, and and a need for high levels of stimulation and risk-taking, accurately described me. (laughs) And so, what the hell? (laughs) So, and just by coincidence, that, that night, or maybe it was the day after, uh, but one evening I was reading myself to sleep with a copy of Scientific American, and it was an article about the agricultural revolution, this, this big change that happened between eight and 11,000 years ago as the ice age was receding and the, and the, and the glaciers were pulling back, and, and, and human beings uh, in some parts of the world started engaging in agriculture rather than um, pastoralism, herding, or rather than hunting and gathering. And I thought, okay, um, I, I was just like kind of drifting off to sleep and I was imagining myself in that hunting gathering world. And I thought, wow, uh, if I was a hunter gatherer and I wasn't constantly distractible, if I wasn't noticing everything in my environment all the time, I might miss that flash of light over there that's a rabbit that's gonna be my lunch, or I might miss that flash of light over there that's a bear that wants to make me its lunch. Mm-hmm. And in either case, I'd get weeded out of the gene pool. So distractibility, this number one characteristic of ADHD, would actually be an asset in a hunting gathering world. And then I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, what about impulsivity, making snap decisions? In fact, um, the kind of the medical dictionary definition of impulsivity is that um, behavior precedes cognition. In other words, um, before you even realize that you've thought about doing something, you're already doing it. And I thought, okay, well, you know, if I'm going through the forest looking for lunch and uh, I'm chasing a rabbit and a deer runs by, uh, I wouldn't want to sit down with a pad and pen and say, okay, let's do a risk analysis. Let's see. Pros rabbit and cons. Is- <laughs> exactly. You just make an instant decision and go for it. Um, rabbit or deer, you, you, you live and die by those instant decisions. So impulsivity, again, would be a survival strategy for a person in a hunting gathering world. And then I thought, well, what about 
you know, this constantly inserting yourself in situations that might even be dangerous because you, you know, you like the stimulation, you thrive on living on the edge. And, you know, I thought, well, that's easy. You know, the, the person who wakes up in the morning and says, I'm not going to leave the cave today because there's bears out there and I'm afraid of bears. I'll just stay here. That person would get, you know, they get weeded out of the gene pool. They starve. Whereas the person who wakes up in the morning and says, you know, it sounds like fun going out there and finding something to eat in a world where those things that I want to eat also want to eat me. That sounds like fun. <laughs> and, you know, that high level of risk and stimulation. And I thought, oh, my God, this is ADHD. ADHD is perfectly adapted to a hunting gathering world. So then what about the agricultural world? You know, the post-agricultural revolution. Well, you know, if, if you were distractible and today was the day you had to go out and pick the bugs off the plants, bug after bug, plant after plant, hour after hour, day after day, and a butterfly went by and you, oh, isn't that nice? And wandered off in the woods following the butterfly. Distractible, you, you would starve. You know, you wouldn't be able to bring in the crops. Um, if so, that's impulsivity, uh, distractibility, or distractibility, impulsivity. If you if you said, well, you know, that wheat grew a lot great last year, but that was kind of boring. Let's try something new. Let's plant ragweed and see what happens. And you discover when it's time to harvest the food that you can't eat it, you know, and then you starve again. Um, so making quick decisions, no, you want to make careful, thoughtful decisions informed by years of experience in an agricultural world. And then finally, needs for high levels of stimulation. You know, the people who want high levels of stimulation, they're the, they're the people who left, right? <laughs> they're like, this is boring. I'm out of here. And, and, you know, as an American, I, you know, I always make the, the joke that, you know, the people in Europe who were ADHD were distractible. You know, they, they just kept moving west until they left the west coast, uh, you know, of Europe. And then they got in boats and they came to the east coast of the United States. And the, the less ADD ones kind of settled down in places like Philadelphia, New York, and started banking and all this kind of stuff. But the more distractible ones, they were like, ah, this is still boring. I think I'll go to Ohio. And then in Ohio, they were like, hey, it's gotten boring again. I think I'll go to Missouri. And then, you know, and eventually they hit the West Coast, you know, the ocean, and they couldn't go any farther. And that's why you have Hollywood. <laughs> that's my shit. Love that. <laughs> That's, I think that the way you break it down is just makes it abundantly clear how, how that really evolved is this distinction right between the people that have this ADHD and and everyone else right and and I think especially in today's world where we've even sort of moved on from this agricultural you know way of living the the effects become even more pronounced um, and so that's when you know situations like like the one for your son happen right where you're told you're dysfunctional you can't essentially do anything out of your life. But what I find so fascinating about your work is you show that that's actually not the case. In fact, there's a huge upside to having these qualities in your life. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I uh, identify ADHD and, and, and frankly, some parts of the autistic spectrum as well as being, uh, if you want to refer to them as deficits or deficiencies or challenges or whatever word you want to use, you're trying to make it non-pejorative, um, they're situational deficits or situational differences. Um, if I, I, for example, um, I, I had a partner in business years ago, this is like 30 years ago, and we had hired his cousin as our bookkeeper. And his cousin so screwed up our bookkeeping that we had the IRS coming to audit us. Ooh. And so I sat down with him and his cousin and I said, you know, what's the deal? And he's like, I don't know. I just hate bookkeeping. I'm easily distracted. I'd rather be out doing something else. And, and so, you know, I, it's just like, I'm really sorry. And he was full of apologies. And I was like, oh, you're easily distracted. And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, you know, have you ever thought about being a salesperson? Because he had a CPA. He, had a, he was a certified public accountant. So he had a profession. But, you know, I said, you know, there are people who sell the services of accounting firms. So, and they have to have CPAs. So instead of being the accountant himself, why don't you become the guy who sells accounting? You can actually make more money than as an accountant. Sales pays really well, and you might find it fun. He was like, hey, I never thought about that. He went off and did that. He became the top salesperson for one of the smaller accounting firms in New York City, wow. made twice as much money, was really, you know, contacted me a couple of years later and said, you just saved my life. So it's a matter of finding the job. You know, if you've got ADHD, you don't want to be a bookkeeper, but you make a great private detective. Yeah. Um, you make a great teacher if you can entertain your classroom, but you might not make, you know, uh, such a good uh, auditor, you know, I mean, there, there are, you wouldn't, you know, standing on an assembly line all day, putting bolts on screws. That's a farmer job. Um, look for hunter jobs. There's plenty of them out there. The media is filled with them, for example. 
Yes, for sure. So is that also what drove you sort of in, into, into your current field? Because what I found, for example, is like, you know, running these podcasts, right? I'm, I'm very, very easy to distract really with everything else, right? With like looking at emails, with studying, with anything. But the one thing basically in the world where I can monomaniacally focus is talking to incredible people like you. So is that also something that you found in, in your own work as, as a radio host where, you know, you can really get into this hyper focus when you're doing what you're currently doing? Yeah, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I've started seven substantial yeah. companies in my life. Um, it killed off one of them horribly. I learned from that failure. Um, uh, walked away from another one, just, you know, it was a nonprofit, just handed it over to other people. And, uh, you know, the rest of them, uh, my wife and I sold, and, and then we would just live for a couple of years on the money. And then when we ran out of money, we'd start another company. <laughs> and um, so I've always been drawn to the stimulation, you know, something new, novelty. And uh, the longest I've ever worked at one thing in my life is five years until I started doing the radio show that I do now, which I've been doing for 18 years. And I started doing that after we'd sold an advertising agency in Atlanta because uh, it got boring, right? Once a company leaves its growth stage and starts at its administrative stage, it no longer needs an entrepreneur. It needs a manager. And I'm a terrible manager. Mm -hmm. So, but with the radio show, Uh, what I find is that just turning on the microphone and knowing that there's 7 million people listening to what I have to say gives me plenty of adrenaline. I mean, oh that's God. that bang novelty right there. And it doesn't go away and it doesn't get old because every day there's a new audience, there's new callers, there's new things to do, there's new things to talk about. Um, it's perfect for, for me. You know, it's perfect for people with ADHD and podcasts and talk radio and all that kind of thing. Like I said, you know, the media is filled with, with people like you and me, hunters. Yeah, no, I absolutely love that. And, and this one realization has really fundamentally changed my life because it also allowed me to really shift gears, shift to the things that I truly care about, where I can focus, right? And then sort of let you own out. Hmm. Yeah, yeah absolutely it's self-selecting. I mean, you, if you do what you love, you, uh, you, the old cliche is, you know, do what you love and you'll love what you do. But if you do what you love, you'll also be successful at what you do. And yeah. if you do what you hate, you will inevitably fail at what you do. And so, you know, it's just... We need to be teaching this stuff in, in like high school, maybe even middle school or elementary yeah. school, you know, know who you are, you know, try, you know, uh, in, in ways that are, that are not critical, that don't, that, you know, don't like do this like the, like that shrink did with my kid. Yeah, and I'd love to take you back to that moment for, for a second to your kid, right? Because obviously being told this diagnosis, right? When, when you're told essentially you're dysfunctional, you can't do this, you can't do that, you basically can't succeed in life, that can be hugely detrimental to, to anybody, especially a young kid. And so what were you telling your son back then? What can you know, parents tell their kids? Or what can people tell themselves if they realize they're struggling with ADHD? What, how did, can it change sort of that belief system to, to make it something positive? Yeah, I think it was initially, you know, that diagnosis was devastating to him. And um, when I came up with this idea about hunters and farmers, I wasn't looking for science. I was looking for a story to tell him because basically we live our lives based on the stories we tell ourselves. The, you know, objective reality is vastly overrated. Most reality is internal and subjective. And um, so I wanted him to be, instead of telling himself the story that he had a broken brain, I wanted him to have some other story that he could tell himself. And so that was the story that I, that I shared with him. And I said, and, you know, our schools are set up along agricultural lines. They're like factories, you know, one hour of subject, then the bell rings, then another hour of subject. And, and you know, you start every day at the same time and all that. It, the schools are set up for farmers. And so, you know, uh, the initial thing that we came up with was, you know, if you want to succeed in the school, you're going to have to take a farmer pill, you know, this Ritalin pill. Uh, we're going to call it a farmer pill. And it just makes your brain work like a farmer's brain. It doesn't make it, it's not, it doesn't mean you've got a bad brain or a good brain or anything. It's just that that's the damn school. Well, you know, within a few months, we figured out that that wasn't going to do it for him. And so we started looking for hunter schools. And we found a really, we lived in Atlanta at the time, and we found this really cool school in downtown Atlanta where the kids ran the school in every wow. respect except, except, except ap academics. The teachers had absolute final say over academics, but the kids made all the other rules. So, for example, they made a rule you don't have to sit at your desk. 
when we went, when Louise and I went down to check out the school, we walked into, the, into one of the classrooms and there's one kid sitting on top of her desk. There's another kid sitting in the windowsill. There's another kid laying on the floor with, his, with a, a pillow behind his back up against the wall, you know, writing on, his, on, a, on a pad on his knees. And I'm looking around going, this is out of control. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, in just a couple of minutes, though, I realized that all these kids were fully engaged in what the teacher was teaching. You know, in the subject matter, because they didn't have to just sit in their desk silently. They could, there was one kid who was walking, he was pacing all through this thing. And, and he, but he was getting it, you know. So, so another one of the rules that the kids themselves came up with is if you didn't maintain a B average, you got kicked out of school. The kids came up with that. The teachers opposed it. Because these kids pay to be in the school. And yeah. teachers were afraid, you know, there goes our paycheck. That's it. Everyone's gone. Yeah. It, it turns out that the kids, once they set their own goal, they all reached their own goal. Wow. <laughs> and so, so, you know, once we got him into a school that actually worked for him, and by the way, that's, you know, college is a lot like that, you know, or at least many colleges are. They're not like high school or gymnasium in Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're, they're not that regimented. There is a lot of opportunity for exploration. You can control your schedule, um, you know, so... College, depending on the college, of course, but generally speaking, college is much more ADHD friendly than is, uh, you know, primary school. And so, you know, the, these are just the kind of lessons that we learned along the way. And again, I, I said I wasn't looking for science, but what's fascinating is I published this book in 1995 or 1996. It was originally called ADD, A Different Perception. It's out in a new edition now uh, called 100 in a Farmer's World, ADHD 100 in a Farmer's World. And And when I published the book, I was speculating, essentially, saying, well, you know, if my theory is true, then if you look at a society that has for thousands of years been highly agricultural, you're going to find very little ADHD there, because in that society, those people with ADHD would be misfits. They wouldn't wouldn't fit in, and so they wouldn't be the optimal person to have as a mate, and so they wouldn't be as successful as at, at reproduction, essentially. Whereas if you looked at historically hunting gathering societies, you probably find a, an exaggerated level of ADHD because that would be the thing that would make you a more successful hunter gatherer. I posited that in the book. And over the years since then, there have been literally dozens of studies. Uh, probably the most, uh, the most interesting one was incidence of ADHD in Japan. Very, very low. Japan's been an, an agricultural island nation, an insular agricultural island nation for 3,000 years. Yeah. Um, and then you compare that with, uh, there's a half a dozen different Aboriginal and Indigenous societies who still live as hunter-gatherers. ADD off the scale. Um, not dysfunctional, highly functional. Yeah. But, you know, if you, if you provide a standardized test to people in these two societies, um, so, you know, there's clearly a genetic component to this. There's clearly a selection process on that genetic component that is environmental and cultural and, and, that, and that works over multiple generations. And I just find the whole thing fascinating. Yes, for sure. So it really sounds like when you know, people with ADHD like us, when we deliberately select situations and environments in our lives that allow us to succeed, right? These, these rather, you know, hunter environments, right? Things where we can interact with people, right? Everything's a lot more fast paced. We have to do the same thing over and over and over again. Then we can deliberately really create success in our lives. So I'm super curious, what other strategies have you found over the years that really allowed you to sort of maximize these hunter upsides and at the same time minimize the the sort of, you know, gatherer downsides? Are there any practices, any rituals in your life? Oh, yeah. There's a whole collection of them in a book called ADD Success Stories, which I don't think is in print anymore, but it's... it's, uh, you know, all these interviews that I did where I asked that question of hundreds of people with ADHD who were successful, um, including kids. And, uh, and I learned some things that I incorporated in my life. For example, um, when I'd sit in meetings with other people or even long conversations, for that matter, even a long conversation with my wife, who is a farmer, uh, which, by the way, I also discovered is a good strategy. If you're a hunter, marry a farmer, right? <laughs> uh, two hunters, I mean, oh, yeah, it's very stimulating. Kind of crazy, um, but uh, you know, I I, mar- I was lucky. Um, mm-hmm. But even a long conversation with my wife, um, I'll take a pad and I'll take notes, and the person I'm talking to thinks I'm taking notes about what they're saying. But what's happening is when other people are talking, there's just constantly stuff popping into your brain, 
And you know, if you don't say it, if you don't interrupt them and say it, you're going to forget it, right? <laughs> so what I would do is I would write down the things that popped into my mind that I wanted to say. So when it was my turn to speak without interrupting, I had notes. I had, you know, I knew what I was going to say. And that was probably the most useful strategy that I discovered in my 30s. You know, this was you know, 30 years ago um, uh, that I still do to this day. I, I do this when people call into my radio show and they, if they've got a complex question or multiple parts or something pops into my mind, I've got a, a ad right here and I write a note on it and uh, then I can just listen carefully. It, it, it liberates you. It lets you go back to listening, right? Because then you can pay attention even better. So, you know, that, that's one example. I, I, I don't have a, a, a collection at the top of my head right now. Uh, be, be, you know, uh, choose, choose your profession. We talked about that. Choose your partner, you know, with this in mind. Although, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be hunters and farmers together. It can be two hunters. Um, in fact, I know some, you know, hunter couples that are, are very successful. Um, there's a lot of relationship stuff. I, I wrote a book about uh, succeeding with ADHD, particularly for adults, um, that has to do with how to, how to work around the relational issues that, that typically come out of ADHD. Um, That's just a start. Yeah, for sure. That's so fascinating. So thanks for sharing that. And I'm super curious, like you, you I, I guess, developed that from, from an early age, I'm assuming. And I know that you've been really fascinated by consciousness by spirituality from from a very a young age on so is that something that, that really came together for you something that you were trying to sort of figure out to sort of combat adhd as a child you know i never i was never identified as adhd when i remember my second grade teacher mrs clark when i was seven years old she used to say i i can still hear her voice with her thick south carolina accent uh, even though i lived in michigan um saying you know Tommy, an empty wagon always rattles. Or Tommy, even a fish doesn't get caught if it, does, if it keeps its mouth shut. And, and, you know, she, she was not a fan of my constantly interrupting her. Um, but, you know, that was about it. I, you know, I didn't do particularly bad in school. I was a pretty smart kid. I didn't do particularly well either because of the challenge of our modern education system. Um, ended up, you know, not graduating from college and uh, as a result of that. Um, but, and yeah, I went on a spiritual journey when I was uh, in my early teenage years that took me through meditation, transcendental meditation and then psychedelic drugs and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I've kind of settled into a uh, spirituality that, that fits my needs. Um, but, but I don't think that any of these, I, I, I think the experience of growing up with ADHD is fairly universal. Um, it's, it's somewhat different for girls and boys. Girls tend not to blurt things out because they're socially conditioned more to be deferential, um, uh, unfortunately. And so they internalize. So instead of interrupting the other person, they're interrupting themselves constantly. And thus they get this label as, you know, the kind of the ditzy blonde thing. Um, that's more characteristic of ADHD in women and girls. Um, although those distinctions are blurring as time goes on and as women acquire more power in society. Um, it was very much the case 30 years ago when I first wrote the book. It's not so much the case now, um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And so, so one of the things we, we mentioned sort of before starting the show is you've actually been to Germany, um, which as a German, I, I'd be remiss not to <laughs> sort, of, sort of dive into that because I know that you met this, this guy called Gottfried Müller that ended up sort of being a, a mentor for yours. So how has your you know, view of yourself and the world sort of shaped during that time? Well, Herr Miller was, uh, he was an extraordinary man. He, he passed away uh, about a decade ago. He, he, uh, he had an amazing young life. He had traveled all over the world. He, and after World War II, as kind of penance for his, I mean, he never killed anybody or anything like that. He got captured very, very early in the war and uh, was in prison right up until the end of the war. Um, but uh, he kind of made a deal with God while he was in prison that he was going to work for peace for the rest of his life. And so he quit eating meat, thinking that that would lead to malnutrition and he might even die. He quit eating meat while he was in prison. Wow. And what he found was over the next couple of years, he got healthier. <laughs> um, and then when he left, he started these programs uh, in Germany immediately after the war for war orphans and, and widows. 
Uh, and then uh, those programs expanded and went international. And that's when I met him. And we were doing international relief work. And so he and I traveled. We started a program in Uganda. It's still there. Uh, there's another program in Togo. I didn't help start that one, but the program is running that. His son is now running the organization. He's a brilliant young man, Samuel Mueller, um, and uh, doing a great job. Um, and it was like meeting a kindred spirit. I mean, I, I, I discussed ADHD with him, and he just always kind of dismissed it as, oh, with that psycho babble, I don't need to know about that. I know who I am. I know who you are. You know, we're brothers. And, uh, and we've got work to do to save the world. I mean, that would be his result. You know, whenever I'd start getting all kind of, uh, you know, uh, introspective about this, this sort of thing. Um, but he had a major influence in my life. He, my experience with him changed my life. And then back in 1987, 88, we actually, we sold a business in Atlanta and moved to Germany and lived there for a year at uh, the Solemn headquarters in, in Stadtstanach. And uh, it was one of the best years of my life. Yeah. yeah, and it really sounds like contribution is sort of this this line that's sort of going throughout your entire life, whether it's giving back like that, founding your own school, actually your hunter school, right? And and all these incredible things. So, so what have you learned really about sort of contributing to others and really helping others sort of rise in life? That's an ethos that I acquired from my parents, although in the 1950s when I grew up, it was also very much a part of the American ethos in general. The idea that, um, you know, we have a responsibility for other people. We have, an, op we have a, an obligation to be our brother's keeper, to support our neighbors, to help other people on the world stage. Uh, you know, the United States had defeated Germany and Japan and both those countries were in ruins and we were helping rebuild those countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we were helping put together an international order that would, that would be peaceful. And, and so growing up in that as a child, I was born in 1951, and so I, you know, I came of age through the 50s and the early 60s. Um, growing up in that, it just, I never even questioned it. You know, that, that part of the reason why I was on this earth was to serve other people, was to help other people, was to be here for other people, and, and to make the world a better place. Um, I, I realize that this is the, uh, I now realize um, that this is also the foundation of both Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and, and, uh, and, and, and arguably Hinduism and certainly Buddhism as well. And, and, and certainly it's at the foundation of the, of the so-called pagan religions and most indigenous cultures. So I don't think it's extraordinary. I think it's, it, it is and certainly should be the norm for human behavior and, and the human experience. Yes, very, very true. And I absolutely love that ethos. And I truly believe if we can get more people into that, then the world is going to be a much, much better place. So Tom, before I ask my final question, where can listeners connect with you online? Well, I, my, my program is online. We carry, it's live streamed on YouTube and Twitter. We get uh, you know, people who are calling because the YouTube stream in, in particular from all over the world. Um, we're on the air from uh, noon to three Eastern time, uh, which would be what, six to nine German time or seven, seven to 10, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. Six, yeah. Hours. six hours difference. Yeah. Six to nine. So six yeah. to 9 PM. And, uh, or 18 to 21, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, in these days people can make international calls with Skype and stuff like that for no cost. Um, and, and we've got a pretty vigorous YouTube channel with, with all the clips on there. My website is TomHartman.com. We, we own all four misspellings, so however you spell it, we'll get you there. <laughs> it is Hartman, you know, kind of German spelling. And, um, uh, oh, and, and most of the writing that I'm doing these days now, I'm doing over at Medium.com. Um, the, the landing spot is Tom Hartman, T-H-O-M, Hartman with two N's, dot Medium.com. Perfect. I'll link to those then. Now, final question. What does it mean for you to max out your life? Maxing out your life means fully experiencing all the extraordinary uh, ness of life itself. Uh, you know, the joy and the pain, you know, not hiding from things, embracing life, finding your passion and pursuing your, your passion. So we should all be maxing out our lives, Max. <laughs> Love that, Tom. Thank you so much for coming on the show. All right, guys, that's it for today. 
I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you gained some valuable ideas, tips, tools, tricks, mindsets, belief systems that will hopefully inspire you to take your life to the next level. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about application. The only thing that's going to set you apart tomorrow from where you are today is how much action you take with those ideas that you gained. And so I really want to challenge you at this point to you know, not just listen to this passively, to not just consume this you know, passively, just think about other things, but to really take those lessons, take those ideas that you just gained and start applying them to your life. So to really start taking action and sprinting towards those goals and those dreams that you have in your life. Now guys, at this point, I wanna ask you for a huge favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider heading over to iTunes and leaving a review, as that helps me really grow the show and reach more people, impact even more people around the world. You know, if you have a family member, a friend, a loved one maybe, that you think could benefit from this content, please consider you know, sharing it with them, forwarding to them, as that helps us really build a community of like-minded people that are all about maxing out their lives. Now guys, with that being said, thanks so much for tuning in today. I really, really appreciate it. Stay strong and see you tomorrow.